morning, everyone. The audience seems to be thinning out as we start talking about the process engineering and manufacturing stuff. But uh, I've got 15 minutes to talk, or 15 or 20 minutes, to talk about a really massive uh, field, which is this whole area of emerging... We're still young enough to have a new start. Yeah, it's it's technologies. Hello. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to canter through this quite, you know, and I've, I've got to pick up just a few examples and treat this fairly superficially in the time that's available. So what I'm going to do is fulfil my contractual obligations and tell you a little bit about Camden BRI Festival, which is the organisation I, I work for. Then very briefly talk about some of the future challenges to give a bit of context to why there's some interest in these technologies. I can skip over that incredibly quickly because um, the guy Andrew from the FDF did a fantastic job of seed setting this stuff for me yesterday. And then I'll go through some of the emerging preservation technologies that are out there. And I'll focus in on four, but there, there are tons of them, so talk to me after if you want to know more. So Camden BRI essentially were a research and technology organisation uh, provided consultative for the food, drink and allied industries. And you can read all the facts and figures there, but the, the main sort of services we offer really are analysis and testing, longer term kind of applied research, um, training, and a lot of operational support, so factory troubleshooting, that kind of thing. And I'm more involved in some of the longer term research and some of the factory troubleshooting stuff. So future challenges. As I, as I mentioned, Andrew kind of went through all this yesterday, so I'll summarise this by saying, We've got some big, big issues that we need to address in the future if we're going to actually be able to feed the global population. And in so, at sometimes, this feels like an almost impossible challenge because we're asked to produce more with fewer resources at reduced cost, with improved quality, with extended shelf life. And increasingly, I think we're entering an era where we'll be developing more and more bespoke products for specific demographic groups, whether it's for the aging population, whether it's for halal, uh, for the halal market or whatever. And I wouldn't like to suggest that emerging preservation technologies are going to be the panacea for all the world's problems, but they're going to play a role in, in solving some of these problems, particularly around shelf life extension, quality enhancement, and perhaps developing functional products. Now, I'll maybe touch on that in a little while. So what are some of these technologies we're, we're interested in? We tend to break down into two main themes, really. Uh, advanced heating technologies for preservation and non-thermal preservation technologies. So these are technologies which will kill bugs without the use of heat. And that's mainly the ones I'm going to talk about today because I've left a lot of the heating stuff to Mark who's going to follow on after me. So let's just run around some of these technologies quickly and I'll come back to some of them because I've got a few videos on, on four of them. We have cold plasma. This is quite a new uh, technology not really being used industrially at the moment, apart from some applications for air purification. But it's a, a surface decontamination technique, non-thermal, for killing microorganisms on the surfaces of foods, food contact materials, packaging, that kind of thing. I'll come back to that one. We also have pulse light. This is another non-thermal surface decontamination technology. Can be used on foods can be used on packaging. The main commercial application, or actually the only commercial applications, are on packaging at the moment. There are over a hundred commercial installations for pulse like that, mainly on uh, decontamination things like uh, caps for water bottles and things like that. <coughs> Some people are advocating the use of ultrasonics for preservation. I'm, I'm actually a little bit skeptical about how achievable that is anytime soon. But I put it up there anyway because it's a really interesting, cool technology because it can do all sorts of interesting things. Um, so it can be used for things like viscosity reduction, enhancing heat transfer, initiating crystallization, foam breaking, emulsification. So it can do loads of stuff. We're very active on ultrasound, uh, but it's not um, really for me going to be used for preservation anytime soon. We have various technologies that have been developed for the pasteurization of low water activity products. Now it used to be 10 years ago, we didn't really worry too much about this. We just thought, well, they're low, low moisture, low water activity. If there's microorganisms there, they're not going to grow. We don't need to worry about it. But we now know that if there's salmonella there, even at very low levels, it can potentially be a food poisoning issue. So there's increasing interest in pasteurization of things like nuts and seeds. 
and I'll come back to one example of that in a minute. And then we have high pressure processing, which is another non-thermal technology for batch pasteurization. This is very widely used commercially now. It's about a $12 billion industry. It's used on everything from fruit juices to sliced meats, ready meals, <coughs> chicken portions, everything you can think of really. And I'll touch more on that in a bit. There are loads of other technologies, as I say, there's things like pulsed electric field processing. This is a non-thermal technology for pasteurizing uh, liquid products, things like juices and smoothies, non-particulate pumpable products. Um, this one here is an interesting technology. Well, I think they're all interesting, but yeah, I need to get out for it. Um, this, is, this is by a company called Anacale. It's a Scottish uh, startup company. It was actually developed as an an aside by the astronomy department at the University of Glasgow. So for anyone who does technology scouting, not like I do, would you have been looking in Glasgow astronomy department for a food technology? Probably not. But the way this works is you take any packaged product with some oxygen, you suck it onto a platen, and you generate a plasma at the interface between the packaging and that platen. And what that does is it converts any oxygen inside the pack into ozone. That ozone then decays back to oxygen and water and gives you surface decontamination of food. The nice thing about it is it's all in a sealed container, so you don't have to generate ozone and try to flush it into packs or anything. It's all inside the sealed pack. Very neat. We have things like the shaker process. This is kind of the next generation of a retort system where we agitate the container in a very novel manner and we get massive reductions in process time. So a product which would have taken 60 minutes in a static retort takes six minutes in a shaker process. So that gives us real benefits in terms of rapid heat transfer and better product quality. Better product quality. And then there's a whole range of volumetric heating techniques like ohmic, radio frequency, microwave and so on. And Matt's going to touch on some of those, so I'll move on. So let's go through a couple of videos of these technologies then. First one here is plasma processing. I um, should tell you these videos are not exactly going to rock your world because I mean this is basically a box, but I'll, I'll show you it. <laughs> but what we have is a conveyor belt with a big box above it, and we're going to pass some strawberries underneath a plasma. Now a plasma is basically considers the fourth <coughs> state of matter. So we know if we apply energy to a solid we can produce a liquid, if we apply energy to that liquid we can produce a gas. If we apply more energy and we do this by electrical discharge, we can induce a plasma state which has a whole load of highly reactive chemical species. So these strawberries are going underneath the plasma now. You can just see a little bit of sort of purpley blue here. That's the plasma. And what's coming off that plasma is things like ozone, UV, reactive oxygen species. And they will give you a surface decontamination effect on the strawberry. I told you not to get your hopes up. <laughs> we're, we're developing this system in collaboration with the University of Liverpool. So, in terms of the benefits, this is just one example where we have um, plasma, untreated plasma straw, untreated strawberries here, sorry, and plasma treated strawberries here. And you can see on day 14 of the shelf life, we've just got one tiny bit of mold starting to develop on the strawberries there. Moving on to pulse light then. Remember this is another surface, non-thermal surface decontamination technology, mainly used on packaging, but could be used on foods. What we have here is we have a bank of lamps above the sample and some below the sample. We charge a series of capacitors and then we discharge them to these lamps which are filled with xenon and that produces a flash of broad spectrum white light which has <coughs> light, infrared, UVC. It's about a 300 millisecond pulse and we'll get on a smooth surface like stainless steel or something we can get a 6 log reduction of TVCs with one 300 millisecond pulse very, very efficient on a smooth surface. On foods, we typically get between about a one and three log reduction, depending on the surface properties of the food. That's a pulse light. And so this is the kind of thing you can do. Um, this is a controlled G sample. This has been pulse light treated. We've got about between a five and seven day mold-free shelf line extension using this technology. But it can be used for food, but as I mentioned earlier, its main application is really packaging. Let's move on to a system called RevTech now. So this is a thermal process for dry products like nuts and seeds. 
And as I mentioned, there's interest in this because there has been a number of product recalls because of salmonella in things like sesame seeds. So we take the product load into a hopper and we're going to auger feed it into this spiral. And this is really the cool bit if you're sad like me because it's going to start vibrating and the product actually transfers up the spiral by bouncing up the spiral. So when, you, when this starts up, you'll see the whole thing start to shake <laughs> and the product bounces up the spiral. And while it's doing that, we can electrically heat the pipe walls and we can inject steam anywhere we want into that pipe system. So we normally dry heat the product, then add some steam, then drive the water off with dry heat again. The reason we want to use a bit of steam is because salmonella is really easy to kill in a wet environment, really hard to kill in a dry environment. So we create a wet conditions for a very controlled short period of time and drive the moisture off. There are many other systems out there that do this kind of thing. This is just the one that we have to be working on. High pressure processing, my baby, I must admit. But this is a non-thermal pasteurization process again. I'm guessing some of you have come across HPP, show of hands, people who are yeah, aware of it or used it. So in this example, we're loading some grapes into a vessel. It looks exactly the same commercially, just bigger, and usually horizontal instead of vertical. <coughs> but there's weight over the top of this, because there's no physical interlocking of the closures. And we're going to bring this up to 5,000 bar of pressure by pumping water in there. To put that pressure into context for people, I always say if you think of two five-ton elephants stood on a strawberry, that's about 4,000 bar of pressure. We get a small temperature rise as a result of compression, typically about three or four degrees for every thousand bar of pressure that you apply. And when we decompress, the temperature reduces again. I'm going to take the samples out. So these grapes have been under 5,000 bar of pressure. Who thinks they'll be squashed? But they are in fact completely intact, but pasteurized. They're not squashed because the pressure is applied uniformly and isostatically via water throughout the load. Next bit I'm going to show you is raw egg. And we always show raw egg because a lot of people years back when they talked about high pressure said it has no effect on the quality and nutritional standards and any effects on the food. If anyone tells you that, they are selling you something because it does have an effect on food products. If you go over about 3,000 bar of pressure, you will start, certainly start to have an impact on proteins. And you'll see that in a moment when we take uh, this egg out. So again, it's going up to 5,000 bar for a minute, I think, in this example. Get that small temperature rise again, and then it will uh, we'll lose that heat when the pressure is released. And I like to show this one as an example of the fact you can get physical changes as a result of high pressure, but also to introduce the idea that we can do some novel things in terms of new products, because I'm not saying it's useful, this product, but if you take this out, the yolk is actually spreadable after the treatment. So we can create quite an interesting texture using high pressure processing. And many of these technologies offer the potential to develop new textures, to retain nutrition, because we're not using heat for pasteurization, and also to retain functional components. So we did a bit of work recently where we wanted to use a, a, a natural blue coloring from spirulina. It's really heat sensitive, so if you try and pasteurize a drink, as we, we produce a drink with spirulina, try to pasteurize it with heating, and you lose the color, it just wrecks it. But if you pasteurize with pulse electric fields, you kill off the bugs, but retain that nice blue color. So if you, if you think of that concept using these non-thermal technologies, it will enable you to use ingredients that you couldn't normally use in a heat process because they wouldn't survive. Whether that's colour or some sort of functional component if you want to make some sort of nutraceutical type product. And we can clearly see some quality improvements. That's one of the main drivers for the use of HPP. This is some asparagus that's been through quite a mild thermal process, actually, 90 degrees C for 10 minutes. This has been through 6,000 bar for two minutes, and this is raw. I know this is bad science, so I've called different colour boards, by the way, but give me a break, it's a bit of work with the company. Um, and you can see that we've got much better retention of the sort of structure and integrity of that sample, but it's had a complete pasteurisation. Now, I don't want to suggest, however, that these technologies are, you know, you can just take and use them, everything's great. They all do have their own individual challenges as well. So, for example, with a lot of the non-thermal pasteurization processes, 
because you're not using heat, you're probably not going to uh, activate all the enzymes that you would inactivate in a thermal process. This means you might have residual activity of things like polyphenol oxidase, so you could get grounding reactions that you don't want, you can get separation, you can lose cloud stability in fruit juices and so on. They're still great, don't get me wrong, but, but they have their own individual quirks and challenges. Many of these non-thermal processes are not effective against spores. HPP is not effective against spores. Full slip feels a bit debatable, but I think on the whole most people would say it's not effective against spores. Um, so you're going to have to also think about formulation, refrigeration, maybe specific packaging that's going to really reduce oxygen ingress, for example. So these things, they're not insurmountable problems, but they are, there are issues you need to think about with these techniques. So just to conclude, uh, very briefly, as I said, we've got some major global challenges we need to address. Some of these technologies can address some of these issues. There are going to be niche applications, though, on the whole, but also many of them are quite expensive. I think the days of us you know, finding a new canning technology that's going to completely wipe out canning, well, it might happen, but I don't think it's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years. Um, and I think it's important to understand the limitations of some of these technologies. And I, and I have to say, in my experience, this is often not done very well. Because I, I have inquired from people, even people who are using some of these technologies, and they're using them on products where clearly the technology is not going to adequately preserve them, which is always a bit of a scary conversation. Because you say, you know, this is low pH, and Australian box lime spores are going to grow in this, and your HPP process is not going to kill them. So you, you have to understand what you're doing with these technologies. So talk to a specialist. It doesn't have to be me. Others are available, but preferably me. <laughs> Okay, so that's a very whistle-stop tour through these technologies. There's tons more I could have talked about, and I'd be happy to pick up any questions now or talk to more to you after this event. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. We have some very useful questions. Yes, please. Hi, very interesting talk. I was wondering, uh, with the plasma and with the pulse light and that, uh, are there any oxidation effects, any loss in the... Uh, nutritional quality uh, because of oxidation with these technologies? Uh, plasma, I can't comment from experience because we haven't looked at any of the nutritional effects yet. I would I would expect there would be some issues. Pulse light, we've definitely seen some oxidation issues on some products. So again, they're not right for everything. If you've got a you know, very fatty product like a, you know, an oily fish or something, that might not stand up very well to the technology. So it's not, it's not right for everything. I think that's a relevant question because some nutrients do accumulate in the peel and the outer layers of fruits and things like that. Yeah, so. that's a fair point. Good. Um, what about ultraviolet light? Have you ever employed that technology? Uh, we're actually installed in a UV tunnel on the 1st of December. Thank you very much for letting me promote that. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, we have done trials on it over the years. It is reasonably well established as a technology. It's a perfectly fine technology, but it suffers from similar sorts of issues as pulse light. If you have any, any areas of the surface you're treating that are in shadow, then you don't get inactivation. Um, but there's, you, know, you can do a lot to overcome that with, with good uh, chamber geometry design and where you put the lamps and so on. But it is, it is in quite wide use. Particularly with liquid, I'm not talking about a solid food, but liquid. Yeah. There have there have been um, thin film UV systems produced. There's also a company called um, Showpure, which you may be familiar with. They make um, a continuous flow UV system for even for turbid liquids, and they do this by um, putting a, a rifled, I don't know what the, the, the word would be, but there's a spiral shape on the pipe so that the product gets. Um, move with turbulent flows that goes through the system and it passes through about 40 lamps and that is in use in, uh, commercially in South Africa. But there are, there are also thin film UV systems out there. One last question for Craig. Yes. One more question. Are there any, is there any progress in terms of converting high pressure from batch to continuous? No, is the short answer. There, there, <coughs> there have been uh, pseudo-continuous systems where instead of putting it into a packet and then into the vessel, you filled the entire vessel 
and the vessel had a floating piston, and you pump water on the other side and move the piston up. So if you had three or four of these units um, in parallel, you could have one filling as one was emptying, uh, as one was pressurising. And that, that was in use for a little while back in the early 90s, but now everyone has moved to batch systems. That they give you so much more flexibility and you can have big particulates in it. Um, so I think at the moment everyone is really looking at batch. Great, many thanks. And uh, lunch page, a chance to talk to the specials, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.